everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Storm Marrero. I am in the title role of the Queen of Hearts. Um, and I'm going to sing Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood uh, between Austin McCormick, McCormick the creative, di creative director, um, and I. We decided on choosing this song to give the Queen a little bit of humanity. You know, she's mad already. We already know that. We already know she's crazy. But don't be misunderstood. Let, don't let her be misunderstood. Okay. Baby, you understand me now. Sometimes you see that I'm mad. Don't you know no one alive can always be an angel? When everything goes wrong, you see some bad. But I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. Oh Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. You know sometimes, baby, I'm so carefree. With a joy that's hard to hide Then sometimes it seems all I have is worries And you're bound to see my other side But I'm just a soul whose intentions are Oh Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood if I see magic I want you to know I never meant to take it out on you life has its problems and I've had my share but that's one thing I never meant to do cause I love you don't you know I'm just human? I have thoughts like anyone. But sometimes I find myself alive, regretting some foolish things, some simple things that I've done. But I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. Don't let me be misunderstood I don't know how quite to follow that up with questions that are going to be as uh, impactful. Um, I had the opportunity to see the show on Saturday. It was spectacular. So it gives me goosebumps all over it again to hear those performances. Um, my name is Mike Bufano. I am the lead of the Gigglers chapter here in New York. So happy Pride, everyone. Um, first and foremost, thank you all so much for being here and for taking your time to, to speak with us today and to perform. Um, I would love to start by just having you kind of go down the line and say who you are and what your role is in uh, Company XIV and Queen of Hearts. Uh, I'm Austin McCormick. I'm the artistic director, choreographer, and founder of Company XIV. Um, yeah. I'm Marcy Richardson. I'm a uh, classical soprano as well as an acrobat and a pole dancer, and I play the role of the Mad Hatter. My name is Lilia Marrero. Um, I've been with the company for a little over two years now, and I play the Queen of Hearts. Hi, my name is Jacoby Pruitt. I'm a dancer in the ensemble, and I play the lead flamingo. Hi, my name is Ryan Redmond. Um, I play the Cheshire Cat. I'm a dancer. Awesome. Uh, well, I think my first question is for Austin. In kind of seeing the amalgamation of the performance, it's really a, a, a unique combination of 
clearly folks who are trained professionally and traditionally in dance and opera and burlesque and circus performance, et cetera. Can you speak to a little bit of how you began the company and what, what kind of the inception was to, to get it where it is today? Sure. Um, so I started the company in 2006, uh, right out of college. Um, and I really wanted to create something, an environment where I could fuse all the things that I love together, as you mentioned, dance, burlesque, circus, um, lavish design. My background's in Baroque court dance and in classical ballet. So at the foundation of everything that we do is really um, you know, a, a, a knowledge of um, our art uh, classically. So um, yeah, I mean, everyone in the company is so multi-talented and so um, unique that that's something that's really special about the work. Um, they all do so many different things that that's what makes the shows kind of so um, dynamic and unexpected, I would say. So um, yeah, I, I really started uh, wanting to um, create you know, what I would like to see as an audience member. It sounds kind of simplistic, but I just um, really wanted to make something that uh, would delight me and would um, you know, titillate and challenge and yeah, all those things that hopefully the show does. Yeah, and, and I think Marcy did this a little bit already in speaking to just the type of training that you have. I would also love to hear from folks, you know, before coming to the company, what were you formally trained in? What was your, what led you to this point? Um, <laughs> well, I, um, I took classes pretty much all my life. Um, I went to the University of Puerto Rico to study music. I grew up in PR, lived there for like 17 years. Um, and like every kid, they want to come to New York. I'm originally a New Yorker, and I came back to New York as an adult. Um, and just finagled around in theater and art until Austin pretty much found me. And he's like, yeah, just come on, come on to this troop over here. I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is me. This is all me. Gla glitter, corsets, being able to showcase my art in such a beautiful setting. Yeah, that's, that's just absolutely fabulous for me. Um, I have a, a bachelor's and master's in opera uh, performance from Indiana University, and I've been studying voice since I was um, 15. And I really was following a very typical uh, trajectory as a classical soprano. I've sung opera all over the world. Um, you know, I've, I was doing a lot of concert work here in New York, and I've been a soloist everywhere from Carnegie Hall to Lincoln Center. I was really like trying to do the traditional, you know, A-list opera uh, career, and. Um, you know, I dabbled with a lot of different companies here. I actually even temped here at Google 10 years ago. I was, <laughs> I was greeting people, uh, setting up virtual interviews, you know, and then I'd go to rehearsal afterwards. But um, I actually sang in an opera that Austin choreographed in 2012, and we didn't have a lot of interaction because it's typical with a lot of opera companies, the dancers and the singers, everything is so compartmentalized. And, uh, you know, eventually I, I started to study pole dancing and um, acrobatics just for fun with no intention of ever putting it on the stage. Um, and I started competing in pole fitness competitions and I, I got really excellent. So there, there's such a, um, an appetite for variety shows and burlesque here in New York that people started asking me, um, do you ever try to do all this stuff together? So in the shows, I sing opera while doing acrobatics and you know, eventually a few years, 2015, um, he was looking for a soprano and I think three different people threw my hat in the ring saying, you know, this girl's doing some interesting stuff. So one thing led to another and I went from singing um, very traditional operas to having a really thriving um, nightlife persona here. Um, I still do traditional opera stuff from time to time, but I really love, I fall in love with the nightlife scene. So that's how I got to be here. Um, I'm from Miami, Florida, and I went to New World School of the Arts, which is a performing arts high school there. I moved to New York to go to NYU, and I got my dance degree there at Tisch School of the Arts. Uh, I danced at Ailey 2, which is the second company for the Albany of the American Dance Theater for a couple of years. And then during my kind of freelance period, um, I went to the first audition for the company um, and didn't get the job. But <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Um, and then <laughs> it's fine. No. Um, <laughs> Um, but I really, in the audition, I was like, wow, this is so fun. Like, this is really something I want to do. And then when you had your second round of auditions, um, a former dancer, Hilly Bowden, sent me a text with the posting. He was like, you should go to this. And I was like, okay, fine. So I went to the audition, and then I joined the company. And I've been here now for about a year and a half. Um, so I'm also from Florida. I grew up doing a lot of ballet, modern dance training, 
Um, I ended up going to the Juilliard School for Dance, which Austin went to as well uh, before me. Um, <laughs> he's old. He's older, okay? <laughs> so I danced for a couple of ballet companies post graduation. I was introduced to Austin through the Juilliard School, knowing about you know his legacy and all that. Um, so doing concert dance and learning all this like high art at Juilliard, choreographers are constantly making these like experimental pieces. And my grandparents are coming to see the show and they're like, what did we just watch, Ryan? And <laughs> my grandma would say, why do you guys roll on the floor so much? That was like her thing. Um, so t with him saying about um, doing things he'd want to watch, that really resonated with me and I could see it in his work. So after doing some hoity-toity ballet crap for a couple years, um, I was like, I want to do Company 14 because it's accessible and it's fun and it's current and, it's, and it is high art as well. So um, yeah, hi. <laughs> awesome. Uh, some of you just touched briefly on it, but I want to dig into it a little bit deeper. I was talking to Austin earlier how as someone who lives in Brooklyn, and you think about the dichotomy between Manhattan and Brooklyn. So even if you're talking about like drag shows, I'm like, OK, this is Manhattan drag, or like, OK, this is Brooklyn drag. And I went to see this performance, and I was like, this is a Brooklyn performance in all of the best ways, right? Can you speak a little bit more about some of your past experiences with that more traditional, laced up training and performances that you've done, and how that transition has worked for you in kind of joining the company and being in the show? I think um, kind of, even though we're more in the experimental and kind of um, immersive theater aspect of what we do, I think because the performers in the company all come from a classical background, the company is run very much in that way. As far as the way we create the show, as far as the way that we interact with each other to keep the show running, it really has this sense of community and a sense of we're very proud of what we do. It's not so much like just chaos. And I feel like sometimes you see stuff and you're like, this is so Brooklyn, because it's just like chaos. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, that's like, not, oh, that's not what I was referring like, to. This is so Brooklyn. <laughs> um, so like, yes, we have that. We can have that aesthetic, that aesthetic to the work. But as far as the way that we present ourselves and bring everything to the stage, I think there's definitely this sense of um, opulence and really careful planning out on how it is, on what it is that we want to execute and what it is that we want to convey. And so I think that kind of sets us apart as far as the vein of what we do um, in, I think, the best way possible. Yeah, and there's tremendous discipline in terms of what the performers do. They're really world-class athletes and artists, and I think you, know, you guys treat yourselves that way, and the structure of the company kind of honors that as well, yeah. And the space itself, it lends for that, because yes, it's high art, but then it has this sense of the, it, it has a grit, grittiness to it, that when you go in, yes, it, you have champagne, you have chandeliers, but you have this sense of, hmm, there's, there's not still, there's graffiti in the yeah, bathroom. Yeah, yeah. It's not sinister, but it's just like, oh, I like this because it, mm -hmm. it has this homegrown Brooklyn vibe. And f for me, on a personal level, I grew up literally around the corner from there, and I left Brooklyn in 1989 in the middle of crack epidemic. So coming back to it is like a full circle for me. I'm like, but it still has that vibe. It still has you walk in, you walk to Brooklyn, and you get out of the train station, and you still see that sense, that tinge, like, yeah, things have changed, but it's still that Brooklyn taste, that Brooklyn smell, and you go into the theater, and yes, you see all this beauty, but it has that grittiness, and it, I really feel that the artist, as well as Austin, bring that grittiness, because the true form, true creativity comes from struggle, and it comes from that background of, I wanna make it, and I'm gonna hustle, and that's the Brooklyn vibe for me. I think one thing that with these stripped down performances here without the costuming and the visuals. It is a visually stunning performance, both in costuming and in set design. My friend that I went with on Saturday, I'm normally a person who likes to debrief things during intermissions, and afterwards you just kind of have to get through it. And she looked at me, eyes wide, and said, my eyes are full. Like I don't, like, I don't know how to process everything. I feel like I need to see this five times. Um, when it comes to essentially taking that bare stage and bare bodies and creating the costume and creating this, the, the experience, I would love to hear a little bit about, it's clearly a collaborative process. Y'all are bringing such different special expertise to the table. Um, how do you kind of combine all of these things and work together to create what that finished product was? 
So um, I have some amazing collaborators. Zane Pilstrom does the sets and costumes, and mm-hmm. Jeanette Yu does the lighting. I mean, we work really close together from the very you know beginning of the idea of the project to really talk about you know what everything could be. Um, but I think what makes the show so special is that performers are so willing to figure it out in terms of interacting with the costumes, and we really ask kind of crazy things of you. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, you could I, easily say, no, we can never do that. I mean, you're in a fully laced corset, upside right. down, in a split, singing, and it's like, you know. <laughs> any other opera singer that I've ever worked with would say, oh, I can't, are you crazy? I can't do that. But I think that's what makes, you know, it's so um, special, is that they're very willing to try and do something unique and um, noteworthy. Yeah, um, when I uh, when I first built was building um, acrobatic pieces and singing, you know, I, I remember them saying, you know what, what size shoe do you wear? Because we're gonna put you in heels for this number. And I said, I don't really, I don't really like to perform acrobatics in heels. Um, and th- the response was kind of like, <laughs> okay, uh, what size shoe do you wear again? <laughs> um, and now I actually, I actually really, I've come to really and en- actually enjoy the challenge um, of like. Yeah, make the heels bigger, make the corset tighter. Like, let me see what I can do. So I've actually learned to um, sort of enjoy um, trying to make pieces around the spectacular costumes because that's what makes it so different than anything else um, you're going to see. So it's it's a challenge, but I think the visual is, is just so worth it. Um, it's so stunning. So I think it's worth fighting for, for sure. Going back to the weird experimental modern pieces, they're probably wearing billowy, maybe silky pillowcase-like costumes because those are functional for movement. But here at XIV, we're wearing these beautiful garments that might scratch you when you dance in them, but we make it happen because we're here for the cause and we don't want to be wearing the pillowcases. We want, <laughs> we want the rhinestones. We want Swarovski. We want... <laughs> And, and our training comes into play because as a belter being cinched for the gods, like I, like cinched, cinched, cinched. <laughs> like, um, I think you, we can make it tighter, right? I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck breathing. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> it's, we're all good. But that's where our training comes into play because then breathing comes into play. Like all, all of our training, especially Marcy, Marcy's classically trained I've been trained as well like we have to learn and relearn and we use it and that's where also our characters come into play because then oh I could create this I I could save my voice here make it sinister you know so the costuming just adds on to the character that's how I feel once I put on the costume once once we're cinched once the heels are on once the wig is on once the wig is on. We were joking last <laughs> night. Like I literally put on the Mad Hatter costume. I'm in like drag, like clown drag. Um, and I honestly, I, I feel like I instantaneously get crazier. Changes just putting it on. entirely. <laughs> if, you, if you ever want to be entertained, method, method her IG on. is Opera Gaga. Her stories, who honey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do that. Do that. If you ever want to be entertained between Wednesday through Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> no, but and I think what's really, you know, what's interesting is being a dancer in the company is we rehearse and build all this stuff in sweatpants and socks and like, in, and we're like, oh, we're going to do this. I'm going to throw this art. It's great. And then we get the costumes that first day and you're like, ah. they're like, all right, and do that thing. And you're like, I, I can't look left. And they're like, what do you mean? And you're like, no, like I physically can't. And they're like, um, try. <laughs> oh, like, hey, I can't see in this. He's like, oh. And they're like, okay, cool. Um, but I think what was really fun about this show was we got costumes and props earlier than we have in the past that I've been here. So we really got to build everything knowing. Like, you're like, okay, I can't see left in this mask. So now I'm going to do a full rotation to make sure I'm here. And like, if you're next to me, please put your hand on my shoulder. And we're here. And But that's what, so like having all those, I think, obstacles kind of makes it more interesting because then it's less, you don't really get to zone out, which is interesting. Like, it's really live performance. Like, there are so many aspects to this show that you have to be fully aware of like what's happening, move out of the way, don't get run over by the armoire, the curtain's coming in, Marcy's in the hoop, she's kicking, oh, that's falling, that light is out. And you're like, yep, got it, great. And then everybody is so on it, on top of each other, helping know, like, okay, oop, that's go- move this way. And it's really good, because I think it keeps the show so fresh every night, is having all that, like, the margin of error is crazy high, and I love it. It's like exciting for us every night. One thing I think, important to know is the the cast we don't have like a we have an assistant stage manager a stage manager 
but we're doing all the the tech work, like raising the curtains, moving the props, striking all the all the stuff. So that's part of the craziness that adds to the unique qualities for the audience. It's really great to see you all interacting as casting creative. You know, like before we're coming into the talk and knowing that you all, you know, are working together on a daily basis, coworkers make or break workplaces, right? Can you speak a little uh, to what it's like going to work every day um, with the people that you're working with, and especially in these environments where you have to trust that that person's going to tap you on the shoulder so you don't get hit in the head with the prop that's swinging from the ceiling? You know, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. I'm really conscious of that when I'm casting. I mean, it's so much. You know, it's it's trying to create the perfect cocktail of personalities, and um, as you say, it matters so much that we all support and love each other, and you know, are on the same page, all working towards the same theatrical goal. So that has been the case thus far in the company that yes. everybody really it, it's respects and loves each other. It's mutual love and respect because then you see, I, I've said this before and I, I'll always say this, iron sharpens iron. So the level of, of talent that's on the stage, you have to build up to that. But then when you see the work that they put in, you want to be a part of that. And then the care that we have for each other. Like if by for some A or B reason, something's wrong, we're gonna cover for each other, we're gonna make sure, like, are you okay? We're gonna do what we can to make sure that the, the artist is safe, and if they need anything from us, like, it's really like a cool family vibe. So when you walk in, you're walking into family. You're in a safe space, and you're always gonna be in a safe space. Well, and we're extremely close, um, <laughs> to say the least. Um, you know, we, we, we're, we sit in very, close quarters you know when we're getting ready and when we're rehearsing so honestly there's like the people who sit around me in the dressing area there's not a single secret there's nothing that they don't know that's going on with me you know we're all we all have ups and downs and and we all just um we're really really close and it's a it's a place where you can come and you know share with your colleagues and you know you guys it, it feels it feels like it's, it's family. family and best friends for sure it's a lot of like really just genuine love for the people that you're around and i think that's what adds to the magic of the show is like if that's god forbid anything goes yeah. wrong yeah it's like we are in that instant second you know exactly what it is how to fix how to help that person and also when we're building the show it's like okay i need you this change who's around me this person's gonna pull my cords like no one has to be like hey and you're gonna change storm it's like you turn around you're like i'm free what do you need Lace up, of course, to get this done. Like in Nutcracker, especially, we all hide, kind of hide behind and get everybody dressed and ready for the next thing. Then get yourself dressed. And it really is just amazing because I think we feel so invested in helping the show move along. And also, through that, you just grow to love the people around you. Like they really are family. You come in every day, you say hi, you have your little jokes, you have nicknames. You're like, whatever happened on that date you went last week? And it's like, really, it's that. <laughs> we sit yeah. up there doing our makeup, just like key keying for 30 minutes. And it's so <laughs> fun. <laughs> It's definitely uh, a frequent comment I hear after the show from audience members is observing that dynamic we have, and I think it is very special to witness, or, or must be. It's what they tell me. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say that, like that, like the audience when they see that, like you guys have so much fun because we genuinely have fun with each other, which translates to the fun that we have on stage. With it, it's it's it translates to everything that we're doing, and the audience sees that and they feed off of that. So as it is Pride Month. Um, in seeing the show, I was like, I feel like queerness plays a significant role in the show, whether it is the androgynous costuming or the breaking out of traditional gender roles when it comes to some of the dancing. To give you all an image, the primary costuming for many of the male cast members is a, an ornate codpiece, a thong, and heels, right? <laughs> so um, can you speak a little bit to how that plays into your experience as a part of the company or particularly this performance? Well, I mean, growing up in dance, weirdly, ballet is so gender specific, and um, it's it's kind of stifling at times. It's too much so. So, it's very fun to not have that be such a black and white here at XIV. Like to be, like I love. There's one part where I get to be like um, a show girl, like sign carrier, <laughs> along with another female, and but we're like, it's gender is not even a thing in that moment. And I really love it. I think, um, you know, often people come to shows and they often say, everyone is in a mask and, of course, in heels. Sometimes I don't, I don't know what I'm looking at. Um, and as you watch the show, you start to realize it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, I also really appreciate, you know, when you look at the casting, I mean, everyone is 
beautiful, of course, but there's so many different body types. You know, some people are very tall. Some people are very athletic. Some people are very uh, curvy. You know, other people... Big bitches. <laughs> big bitches. <laughs> other people like myself, like from the back, I mean, I look like a dude. Um, I, like, people on my Instagram will be like, who's that guy? I'm like, oh, it's me. Um, <laughs> I'm a pole dancer, we got lats. Um, but, but, you know, I, I also have spent a lot of time, you know, when I'm auditioning for opera and music theater, getting a lot of feedback, like, oh, you know, soften it up, like be a little bit more feminine, you're coming on a little too aggressive. And it's refreshing to come to a space where it's like, great, put on pants and a codpiece and be aggressive. Um, you know, it's just refreshing to just get to embrace all, um, all just aspects of the of the fluidity that so many of us have already. And Austin has always been very adamant on just blurring those lines very, very much to the point that there are no lines. Like, there are no lines. Like, you're a Cuneo, Michael Cuneo, who plays the White Rabbit during Nutcracker, he dresses as um, Mother Ginger with full-on boobs and hat, and then all of a sudden he's stripped to nothing. Like. Austin has been very clear that he doesn't want a line, and that's the beauty of it. Yeah, totally. I feel like it's also awesome for, I think, a lot of us. We really get to live out our fantasies on stage, which I think is really fun, and it also allows for me, I feel like I have such a better understanding of myself and how I relate as a queer person in this world, as a queer person of color in this world, and it's really just an amazing thing to have this job to come and just be exactly who you are and never have anyone tell you that that's wrong or that that's weird. It's just, that's beautiful. I love that. You make me laugh. You make me smile. I go home and I'm thinking about this. I've taken photos. It's such a like, warm feeling in your heart to just be like, who I am is making a difference in this world and really getting to be expressed on the stage and put under beautiful lightings and in million dollar costumes. And like for me, I get to be the flamingo and my costume is this elaborate showgirl, full head flowers, backpack wings, a skirt, Eight like huge pumps, and then I have a huge flamingo. So after you strip all this off, I use a flamingo, this giant flamingo head as a dick, and get to swing it around. And it's like really, it's so fun. You walk in, it's full glamour of lip syncing. There's huge lashes, and then I'm like, guess what? <laughs> and for me, like really, it's so it is so fun every night. And you watch people's face in the audience, and they're like cracking up, or they're like, this is my favorite. It's people on the front row who are like, <laughs> and then their mouth is open, so like glitter goes in, and they're like. <laughs> my favorite every night I'm like and if, if you come in questioning things you're in the wrong place but thank you for coming and please come back again so you can question it some more I'm gonna be real confused. yeah I, I, I sat next to what seems to be a relatively buttoned up older couple who I think were just not knowing what to expect when they walked into the room um, all right we're gonna kick over some microphones so we can start over here thank you for coming Marcy you'd said at the end of your song or in your song that you get hate mail about some of the political stuff and whatnot. And actually, you just sort of touched on it right at the end there about um, some people might not know what they're in store for, they might not be comfortable or, or with how the boundaries are pushed. You have mentioned a lot of positive feedback the show has gotten. Can you talk a little bit about um, like so how some people's minds have kind of been opened up or at least some of the, the negative things you've received that you've helped to overcome? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm... I was surprised when I first started seeing, you know, little just like reviews here and there, because um, I always just assume everyone coming to a show like this is on our side. And, you know, you realize that maybe they're not. Maybe there are people who do disagree with you in the audience. Maybe there are people who disagree with me here in this audience. I don't know. Um, but, you know, I've gotten some messages saying like, hey, you know, that one part of the show, it, I was in this fantasy world and then I got taken out of it. And, you know, that's not the point of the show. And I'm kind of like, well, first of all, um, so you're telling me what the point of the show I'm in is? Okay. Um, you know, but again, burlesque's roots are in satire and political commentary. So even though we are this world of fantasy, um, there is shit still going on. And more often than not, people come and the feedback I get after the show is, wow, you know, I, I've been in a neg negative space, you know, there's so much negativity in the news, um, you know, and about sexuality and, and Me Too and the politics, and they come to our show and they, they see um, the joy and the playfulness in the sensuality, and they, they often say, you know, it really lifts me up, um, but I'll get that, but the political thing kind of took me out. But that's, that's just part of 
that's just part of what burlesque is. And um, you know, I, I change the song here and there depending on what's happening in um, what's going on in the news. And I just think, you know, it's just two minutes of the show. It's not we're not going to apologize for it, um, you know, or tone it down or or try to. Um, you know, you might, it's okay to disagree, but you could still come and enjoy, enjoy the art. Um, and if not, don't come. <laughs> totally. I feel like some of it, this is part of my French, but some of it's kind of like, fuck your opinion. Like, we're up here doing what we do just because you don't like it. Everybody around you here is having an amazing experience, and we're really trying to appeal to the people who are on the same plane as us, who want to go on this journey with us. And if that's the one thing that makes you feel like, well, I can't support this. And I'm like, that really sucks for you. You're closing yourself off to so much. Like, the fact that that negates everything else, all the beauty, all that you're seeing, all the love. We exist in this space to come and share love. I really feel like that's what we do. We bring we bring a good time to everyone. And it is a little unfortunate sometimes when people have those rigid lines. They're like, well, you crossed this. And I'm like, OK, well, okay. sorry. <laughs> write a letter about it. I don't know. <laughs> Marcy likes to read them, so you can write to Marcy. I love reading them. I love it. It gives me so much pleasure. So don't think I don't love it. I, I, every time someone's pissed about it, I'm like, yes, I'm into it. Awesome. Hey, so I've actually seen The Nutcracker several times, and you guys are amazing. I remember like things each of you have done on stage, and I've loved it. Um, and I brought my parents and my in-laws, and Yay. yeah, they, they love it too. But to sort of this point, I'm curious, you know, it, it's clearly burlesque, right? Like that's, and that's how I found it. it was, I saw an ad years ago that was sort of like, want to see a great burlesque show? Come see. But as you've all hinted, you're really trained. I mean, you're amazing artists, right? And, and the costumes, even though they're burlesque, as you said, they're clearly very expensive and beautiful costumes, right? And I, and I remember taking my in-laws and they were sort of like, oh, you're taking us to a strip show. I can't believe it. Because people think burlesque is like panties and a bra, right? <laughs> Have you guys found, especially as a marketing strategy, like how do you convey like the, the real art? Like I, I've been astounded and everyone I've taken has been astounded and they've almost saw, seen like the burlesque piece as like, no, it's just so much more than that, right? And how have you approached that as a marketing strategy and sort of generally? I think what's great about the shows is there's so many elements that there's kind of something for everybody. If you love circus, there's circus. If you love dance, there's dance. If you know you love live vocals, there's that. Burlesque is one element of what we do, and I think we found that it um, is a way to kind of get people in. Everybody, everybody now is a little bit familiar with going to a burlesque show. There's a, a culture around it. Um, but we get that feedback a lot that people come and say, oh, I was expecting like a show in a bar or, you know, for this to be much more, I don't know, casual or kind of off the cuff. Um, so I think it's exciting that people come with a certain expectation and then are surprised by it and that there's sort of more to the story. Company XIV is just a bunch of juxtapositions, like fusions, and the main one is hashtag Baroque Burlesque. Um, so you have this hot, like, two ends of a weird spectrum combining. Um, but people will come and they'll say, oh, this is my first burlesque show. And I'm like, oh. calm down. Like, that, no, like, your first burlesque show is going to be in a dive bar in the Lower East Side. <laughs> like, this is. And not to knock the not dive bar. Not to knock that, but like, because at least for us, yeah, yeah, we're in the nightlife. And I've worked with amazing burlesque performers that are classically trained and they hustle. In the dive bars, you know, if you go to like, let's say, Dwayne Park or Slipper Room, you go there and you'll, you're gonna see, you wanna see burlesque? Go there, see that night gritty burlesque. But we're offering a different, burlesque comes in different forms. So we're just presenting a different form of burlesque. Yeah. When I used to describe, you know, Austin came out of Juilliard and made the company, I think, first and foremost, as a dance company. So I used to say, oh, it's a dance company that fuses opera and burlesque and circus to tell a story. And I think, I think you say dance company and you, people automatically go, Err. like, they think, oh, boring ballet, a, a, ooh, it's too <coughs> modern dance, or, you know, and it's, I think sometimes people have a negative um, affiliation with that word. So I think, Baroque burlesque, it just, it's, it's more accurate. I always tell people, it's more, it's sort of like the Moulin Rouge of New York, except everyone's classically trained and it's gayer. Um, <laughs> That's, a slogan. That's a new ad. It's gayer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the Moulin Rouge, the got, there's not even a single male bare chest, yeah. but there's like 500 females. 
bare chest. And and knocking. when they ask too many questions, I just, just come to the show. Mm-hmm. Just come to the show. Like at, at the end of the day, come to the show and you're gonna go out with your own thought process of what it is. Because again, I can't tell you, you have to see it. It's a spectacle. It's a spectacle, <laughs> that, is, that, tr- that is very true. Storm teed up my question, which is around venues, uh, two parts. So my favorite venue is the Slipper Room in New York and I've seen a company uh, perform there as well. But I'm sure it's very different from your regular place. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how the venue changes or what your what venue you would like to go to in New York to bring this show. And the second one is around uh, what happens at venues in terms of like, um, we, we know that in burlesque, not all of the venues are as diverse and inclusive as they could or should be. And the Slipper Room might be an example again. You've clearly created a company that is diverse and inclusive. Uh, what can we as customers do to maybe help change that beyond, you know, put our money in your show rather than in someone else's show? Are there other things we could do? So we were a mobile company for many years. I started the company in 2006, and we used to do sort of seasonal pop-up performances um, in different venues around the city. And I had looked for years and years and years to find a space where we could be have a more permanent presence. Um, so we are now in a space in Bushwick, and uh, we opened, this is almost our second year, I believe. So um, that's allowed us to really make the work differently. Jacoby kind of hit on this, but you know, we're making the shows in this immersive environment and really customized to that space. So we're exactly where we want to be. And, th- you know, th- the space is really um, facilitating more creativity and allowing us to have more interaction with our audience. Um, it's a very intimate space. So, um, yeah, it's really working well for us. If you're a fan of, of burlesque or nightlife and there are performers um, th- that are diverse that you love and follow, Go to all their stuff. You yeah. know, follow them. You know, everyone posts what they're doing, what they're up to. You know, go and show, go show your support. Tip them. Um, you know, those are all all, all ways um, to use your voice and to support um, to, to to support artists that you want to support for sure. Hi, um, I'm Jess. Forgive me while I fangirl for a second because I'm obsessed with this show. I saw the Cracker Rouge last year and never looked back. And I've seen Queen of Hearts twice, and I won't shut up about it. I tell everyone. I, I follow you and Kunio. I follow everybody. I'm obsessed. I can't help myself. But when I do tell people about it, I do kind of call it like an adult like variety show. And I always say that it is loosely based on, you know, either Nutcracker or that. So I would love to hear like what process goes into deciding what you're going to interpret and exactly how like not to spoil anything for anyone but like I love every moment but the caterpillar interpretation just like to mouth on the floor Mm -hmm. both times and I I get excited to see everyone's reaction when I go again so just if you could talk a bit about like how you decide what you're going to do kind of how you pick apart those pieces and to make sure that you're still staying on narrative but you can also kind of go wild Mm -hmm. so As you said, the company really reimagines either fairy tales or classical ballets. So um, that's always the backbone of the jumping off point for me. And I'm honestly really inspired by the people that I work with and the company of artists that, um, you know, that I have. So a lot of what a lot of the ways I decide on the sections or the casting or that kind of thing is based on, you know, who I think would be right for it and how we kind of push what they do to the next level. Um, the caterpillar, Lillian uh, Lace, who's the performer that does that role, she has an act where she smokes. So I had seen that act, and we had talked about like ways of building on it or developing it a little bit. And so now she's smoking three cigarettes at the same time and doing incredible contortion and crazy, you know, striptease and just amazing things. But um, I'm always really inspired by you know what people do and the skills they bring to the table, and then how do we just turn up the volume and um, and push it. As somebody who grew up involved in and loving theater and then to this day super obsessed consumer of everything else in Wonderland, I just want to say thank you because the fun, the magic, and also the love that you see is like unparalleled. It's one of the best shows, honestly, I've seen in maybe 10 years. So thank you thank so you. much. Yeah, that means a lot. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. So I've seen several of the shows and my favorite part, or one of my favorite parts, is just the interesting and unique way that you incorporate music in unexpected ways. Uh, The first show that I saw was Nutcracker Rouge and Marcy, you did a French operatic version of Yellow by Coldplay, which was something I didn't know that I needed in my life. (laughs) To this day, think about it. (laughs) 
So I was just wondering if you could speak to that part of the creative process. How do you choose the songs? How do you choose how they're going to be performed? And maybe has there ever been a song that's been cut that you were sad to see go? Um, y yeah, so what we do that we think is interesting is um, we'll often do an opera flip or uh, on the contrary, have a rock singer sing you know, an opera song. I feel like it keeps um, modern music, it gives it more of an old school um, opera flair. Um, while we also incorporate Baroque music in, in sort of a new way. So it, it, we combine the old with the new, I guess. And, and um, Austin, usually if he has some ideas for songs, he'll send me three options and say, hey, you know, the Mad Hatter, we're going to have this crazy acrobatic thing happening. Here's three songs I'm thinking of. And usually there's one in particular that will stick out to me. And then we look for arrangements and ways to make it classical, change up the keys and software to make it uh, fit, fit operatically. Um, obviously, I'm trained in, in French, German, and Italian as an opera singer. So we'll often uh, translate into French as an homage you know, to Louis XIV, you know, company 14, hence. Um, so that's kind of what happens with that. That's why we love to put things in French. Um, but yes, I, I think that opera is also another thing that people get a little bit intimidated by. So incorporating pop music as an opera singer, I think is just one way that we can, we make the show accessible uh, to people who might not otherwise have ever heard uh, a live, um, unamplified soprano uh, voice before. So, so yeah, I think that's really where that comes from. It, it's also one of my favorite parts in the creation is seeing what he's going to choose. Um, like, my Cheshire Cat solo is to Tom Jones, What's New Pussycat? And once it starts, the audience is like, oh, okay, yeah. Like, and it's witty, it's, it's fitting, it's cute, and it's, like, I think Austin's very good, and I think he also enjoys it. Like, and if you listen to the playlist and intermissions, it's also curated, like, there are themes happening in the songs that are chosen for Wonderland. But if it doesn't fit, it gets... I mean, there was, well, no, there was, we did a bo boy less bullfight. No, but it's usually mutual. We, I, we built um, an acrobatic soprano piece, and about, it was like a week before tech, or tech was about to start, and I said, I, I don't think this song is right. And he's like, I don't think it's right either. So we scrapped it, and as we went into tech, did a totally different totally different song. It was by Lamos. But, you know, as an opera singer, I've gotten to do Yellow, Chandelier by Sia, Poker Face, um, Partition by Beyonce, um, Cardi B. I did I Like It Like That. So it's been really cool to interpret all of, all of these songs. I'm, I'm always really excited to do it. So, but yeah, sometimes if it doesn't work, just try, try something else. Try yeah. something else. When we, we know it. When we were Bullfight, we had I want to say like three dance numbers that got cut that we were like working, building, and then you're like, we don't need it. And we were like, oh, okay, great, sure. And you're like, let's just go back to this idea and this song. And we we're like, oh, that's a good song. Oh, oh, yep, mm -hmm, great, <laughs> good idea, love it. My first exposure to you guys was three years ago when I moved to New York. I found a clip online of some puppies, the uh, the dog act from Nutcracker Rouge. And so even after seeing that clip coming to the show, my expectations were completely subverted again. So <laughs> phenomenal job. Um, can, can, any insight into what's coming up next? Where you might go? Can we get? S <laughs> Tell me, please, please. I want to know. <laughs> so we're running this show through mid-August, and then the next uh, new show we have planned is the Return of Nutcracker Rouge, which every year is yeah. totally different and reimagined, and new <laughs> artists involved. Um, and the spring show, I'm thinking things over. I can't quite <laughs> reveal yet, um, but I'll come back and tell you as soon as as soon as it's decided. So one last question for you all. As creatives, artists, directors, if there's one thing, and it doesn't have to necessarily be all the time, but whatever comes to your mind right now, that you want people to walk away from this show, either feeling or thinking or mulling over, what would you say that is? Almost every show, someone comes up to me either crying or saying they're speechless or saying it's, it's um, the best thing that, that, that's happened to them in this month or this week or this year. Um, so I feel like we're, we're getting that reaction actually all the time. Um, and people come up to me all the time and say, oh, you're probably so tired of hearing this, but I was so surprised and so delighted. And, and I just say, I never, ever get tired of, I never get tired of hearing it. Um, 
you know, we, we do this a lot. You know, we have a really intense schedule, and I always remind myself every single show, there, you know, this is my 10th production, I was just realizing, um, with the company. And I think, wow, people must be, know what to expect. They must be sort of sick of me or, 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 or used to it. But every single show, someone is new that has never, ever seen the company. Someone who has never seen burlesque. They've never seen circus. So you have to remind yourself, no matter how many times you do the show, there's people coming in that are, they just have no idea. So you have to, you have to, be a hundred million percent every single show um, for those people and everybody else, but but the reaction is is so positive all the time, um, and I'm we're always so grateful for the kind words for sure. I think I like what I would like for people to take away uh, while they're in our space and watching our show is that life can be really beautiful and you belong. Everyone belongs somewhere and like. I hope they feel just like safe and inspired and beautiful. And I think they do, mm -hmm. what you guys were saying. I think I want everyone to leave the space as in love with the company and as in love, in love with the performers in it as I am. I really feel so lucky to do what I do and I am so proud of it and I love it so much and I love coming to work and sharing. And I just hope that, and this is generally what we get, but I really hope that everyone who leaves has just like their heart is full. And then when they think about this place, they think of it so fondly and they want to come back. They want to spend their time with us. Because we see people sometimes five, six, seven times in a row and it's really wonderful to create a relationship with these people who come to the show. It, it really can transcend more than just like, hey, come to see your show. And it's really like you learn their names and you follow them on Instagram and you like really get to know these people and it's wonderful to continuously share. And they come because they want to see what, how you can push yourself forward, you know? <laughs> I would just say that you know performing and creating comes from a place of generosity for us. So I hope that audience leaves feeling, I think lo love is the big yeah. word of the day, but, but they leave feeling loved. Amazing. Well, it has been a joy to have you here. I was surprised and delighted when I went to see the show. For those of you who have not seen it, I highly encourage it. But thank you all so much for being here. Um, and let's give them a round of applause.